The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone. Really lovely to see you out to our service of morning worship here at St. John's. And see a couple of new faces. My name is Ross, I'm the rector here, and you're really warmly welcome as you gather with us uh, to seek God's face. As it's the first Sunday of a new month, uh, we're going to be using new little sheets. So we'll be using our purple order of service. Make sure you have, well, it's lilac-y, purpley lilac something along those lines in that, that general area. Um, it says, give thanks at the top. We'll be using that and we'll be using the hymns and songs for October. So it'll, it's, a, it's a white sheet again, a white hymn sheet, but it's particularly for October. Uh, just stick your hand up there and our ever willing Tom will sort you out if you don't have either of those two things. Thanks, Tom. So turning to the purple sheet then. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Human sin, our sin, disfigures the whole creation which groans with eager longing for God's redemption. And so we confess our sins in penitence and faith. Let's just take a moment or two of silence and we allow God the Holy Spirit just to search our hearts and then we'll join in with uh, these uh, prayers together. You delight in creation, in its colour and diversity, and yet we have misused the earth and plundered its resources for our own selfish ends. Lord, have mercy. You have brought order out of chaos, light in darkness, good out of evil. But we have preferred darkness in words and deeds which dishonour God's holy name. Christ, have mercy. You have showered us with blessings, but we have been grudging towards others, lacking in generosity in word and deed. Lord, have mercy. And so may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins. May he restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Turning to our sheets, or hymn sheets, the white ones, let's stand and sing together the first song there, O Jesus, I Have Promised.
So remaining standing and turning back to our purple sheets. O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Let's take our seats. And our first reading this morning is our psalm, and it's Psalm 19, some verses from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the beginning is now, and shall be forever. Amen. And our second Bible reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, chapter 12, beginning at verse 12, at verse 1. So 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 1. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between Spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. This is the word of the Lord. So let's stand together. And we're going to declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let's sit or kneel to pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the Queen. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, may it clean our hearts within us. And a collect for the 17th Sunday after Trinity. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Teach us to offer ourselves to your service, that here we may have your peace, and in the world to come may see you face to face, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So in our intercessions this morning, I'm going to introduce an area of prayer and then leave a little space for our own private prayers in the silence of our hearts. And then we'll finish off each area of prayer with a call and a response. And this morning, the call and the response is, I'll say, the Lord of hosts is with us. If you can respond, the God of Jacob is our refuge. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let's pray. And we pray to the Lord, to the God who is our shelter and our strength. The one who is always ready to help in times of trouble. And this morning we pray for our communities. We pray for the elderly, some confined to their homes and separated from families and support. We pray for our children, for teachers, for school principals charting a new course in schools this term. In the silence, let's pray for these. is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. This morning we pray for the vulnerable in our society. We pray for those who have lost a source of income. We pray for those who fear they may lose their homes. We pray for those who have no home. And we pray for those offering every day extraordinary kindness. Let's pray for these ones. The 
Lord of hosts is with us. This morning we take time to pray for those who are sick. We pray for those afflicted with coronavirus. We pray for those with other illnesses and conditions. We pray for those struggling with their mental health and for all who suffer. The Lord of hosts is with us. We pray for the wider world. We pray for leaders of the nations. We pray for their governments. We pray for areas that are most besieged by the pandemic. We pray for broken places where health care and resources are scarce. We pray for peoples at war. The Lord of hosts is with us. And finally, we pray for the church. We pray for fellow members in the body of Christ throughout the world. We pray for churches here in Ireland, in Belfast, and specifically here in Orangefield. We pray for our Presbyterian friends, for the House of Worship, for Glenburn, for Agape, for other churches in our patch. We pray for David, our Bishop, and for our prison and hospital chaplains. For all of us who are part of this St. John's family. The Lord of hosts is with us. Lord, thank you that you are in the midst of us. Open our eyes to see you. And keep us fearless in proclaiming your word and your works. Make us lights in the darkness. Amen. Very thirsty this morning. So uh, our theme, those of you who have been uh, coming out or checking online, our theme uh, this term is listening to God. And it's a theme which I think is becoming more and more critical in these confusing times that we live in, that we're led by the Good Shepherd, that we don't just pay lip service to that, but we're actually listening to God and being led by him. A wee recap then, so far in this series, we've seen how God is a God of relationship, a God who communicates with us. But often, if we're honest, we're distracted, aren't we? We're distracted by all the other voices that are going on or sometimes we don't really want to hear God we don't really want to listen to what he might have to say to us then we looked at how God speaks throughout the Bible so we we went back to the Bible to show that this is not just something that we've dreamt up but throughout the Bible we see God speaking to different people and how after Pentecost God makes it clear that he has uh, change the way that he engages with people and he longs to speak to all of us if we will have ears and eyes to hear and to see in the last couple of weeks we've moved on to see how god speaks in the first week we saw how god principally speaks through the bible through what has been revealed and inspired by him and written down and sonia spoke about the logos and the rhema you might remember that week and then last week norman spoke about how God the Holy Spirit speaks to us and he reminded us that God the Holy Spirit focuses our attention on Jesus that he focuses our attention on the death and resurrection of Christ because it's through that that we can have relationship with God 
and also how the Holy Spirit highlights pertinent biblical truth to us. So this week, we're going to dig a wee bit deeper on those ways in which the Holy Spirit speaks to us, and particularly about how the Holy Spirit speaks to our inner selves. And we'll look at three ways he does that. There's a number, but we'll look at three. Any of you who have good memories, cast your mind back to May 2019. And back then, we did a little mini-series here at St John's on spiritual gifts. Some of you may remember that. Um, During that series, we defined spiritual gifts in this way, that they're God-given abilities distributed to each individual Christian by the Holy Spirit that allows him or her to help the church carry out God's mission on earth. I'm sure you have that definition just on the tip of your tongue, but it's always worth reminding you, and it's worth revisiting that definition because it reminds us of a number of key things. First of all, that no one who's a Christian is excluded from these gifts, that God's a generous and good God, and he gives these gifts to his people, to everyone who's a Christian. And then the second thing we notice from this definition is that the gifts aren't to big us up, to make us look more important, but they're to big Jesus up, they're to glorify Jesus, to use biblical words, they're to lift him up. And then Paul adds in another letter that they're to lift Jesus up and also to bless other people. So they've got that love God, love others component that so much good theology has. You may also remember from last year that Gifts are given to us by God's grace, that we have a good and loving Father who gives us these gifts as a gift. But remember that we have a choice. God's grace can be dismissed or received just like we can choose when God draws us to himself. We can choose whether we want to accept saving faith and become a Christian. We can say, actually, I'm happy going my way, don't really need you. So with these gifts, we can accept them and embrace them, or we can say, actually, keep your gifts. I'm all right without them. So the reason why I tell you that is I want to ask you to do something as I speak this morning. I want you, as I'm speaking, if you find yourself being dismissive about the things I speak about, or to disqualify yourself, because a lot of us think, Ah, well, these are for super Christians or for really good people. Actually, no. They're good gifts to all Christians who all of us are sinners saved by the goodness of God. So don't disqualify yourself. Don't dismiss them. And if you find yourself doing that in your heart, just stop and say, actually, God, what do you want to say to me about these gifts? Would you give me faith to engage with these gifts and use them? Because if they're for your glory and for the blessing of others, then I want them and I need them. Will you do that? Some of you will. By the way, feedback's really difficult with masks. So do the big, and then I'll know what's going on. Because it was at the 10 a.m. We started our 10 a.m. earlier, and I couldn't see what anybody was thinking. So give me a wee bit more of a, a nod or a shake. Anyway, so with this background in place, let's look at what some people refer to as the revelation gifts. Three ways in which God the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And they are from that passage I read. I read about uh, a message of knowledge or a word of knowledge, a message of wisdom or a word of wisdom, and the discerning of spirits. We're going to look at those three things, all from that passage in 1 Corinthians 12. A word of knowledge is when God the Holy Spirit reveals something about a person or a situation that is unknown to us. For example, maybe you're really concerned about someone or praying for someone, And God might show you what is really irking them. The the reason behind their their lowness, their, their, their feeling low. In order that you can pray effectively for that individual. In order that you can love them more and pray effectively for them. Or very practically in your workplace. And I know a friend that this happened to. He was an engineer and he was working on a piece of equipment. And he couldn't get it fixed. And it was really winding him up. He's a good engineer. And he prayed and God showed him the specific part of the engine that he was working on that was broken and he was able to go in and to fix it. So it was a revelation in order to 
fix that piece of machinery. There's a whole lot of ways in which God can give us a word of knowledge. The important thing is not the detail of the word of knowledge. The important thing is the impact it has in terms of God's agenda. And mostly, nearly invariably, God reveals these things for two purposes. To show you that he's alive and to show you that he's interested in your life. That he loves you and he loves the person that maybe you're engaging with and praying for. That he's alive and that he loves you. There are a number of examples of words of knowledge in the Bible. In week one, I gave you an example, probably the best example. Let me just remind you of it. Do you remember when Jesus engaged with the Sumerian woman, uh, or the well, woman at the well in Samaria? Do you remember that? And they had the thanks, Ian. And they had a bit of a dialogue together. And it was revealed to Jesus that the woman had had five husbands and that the man that she was currently with was not her husband. Now this was revealed to Jesus and he spoke it out, not to humiliate the lady, I'm sure that Jesus said it very compassionately, but what happened was it opened the woman up to a really deep conversation about spiritual need. It opened everything up. Before it was just a bit of a conversation, but because of this insight, because of this word of knowledge, God's agenda was furthered. Jesus was able to speak deeply to this woman about her need. Can you see what I'm talking about? Words of knowledge can come to us in a number of ways. They can be like a thought or an impression. That's how it happens with me. I'm not a very pictorial person. It's a a thought or impression. So, for example, once I was praying for a young man, not not here, I wouldn't uh, share anything that that was confidential or private. But I was sharing with a young man, and a phrase came to mind which I shared with this individual. And whenever we talked about it afterwards it turned out that every night this individual was being woke up tormented by something that his father had said to him his father had said to him this was a young man in his early 20s and he was waking up every night about something his father had said a particular phrase which made him think i can never mount to much i can never particularly be a good dad i can never be a good dad but God gave me a phrase which was a little bit of a tweak on what the father had said, which showed this individual that God thought very differently of this young man. That God thought he was highly valued, he was of great worth, and that he could be an incredible father. And so through this word of knowledge, this individual was given hope and peace and able to view things very differently and get a good night's sleep. Other people I know receive words of knowledge in the form of like a picture because they're pictorial or they get a sensation in their body. Oftentimes if you know that you don't have a pain in the particular body but you're with someone and you get a pain, maybe an acute pain in the neck or in the wrist or something, God might be showing you that he wants to bring healing to the person you're with. So you ask God, why why is my wrist suddenly very sore? And you listen to what God might be saying to you. And sometimes he's saying to you, I would like you to pray for that person because they've also got a really sore wrist and I want to heal it. So sometimes it's sensations in our body. Sometimes people receive words of knowledge in a vision or a dream. I've never had those. I just sleep usually. Some people actually see a word superimposed over an individual. So they might see a word that God reveals something about them. We're also different. The point is that God knows us best and speaks to us in different ways. Now, hold on. I'm going to come back to that. But I just want to talk about the other revelation gifts first. And then we'll talk a wee bit more about the practicalities. So, word of knowledge. What about word of wisdom? What's a word of wisdom? Well, a word of wisdom is a message from God which brings insight or understanding, clarity in a particular situation it removes confusion and brings peace removes confusion and brings peace it's like a eureka moment or the lights go on that sort of thing when you pray specifically god shows you a way through the best example of this in the bible is king solomon do you remember that story in one kings three these two ladies who came to him arguing over whose baby had died and whose baby had lived do you remember that And Solomon interrupts them. And what does he do? He dramatically orders that a sword's brought and they cut the baby in two. 
Of course, the woman who was the real mother pleaded for her son and saying, please don't kill the child, give her the baby. And in that way, the king wisely ruled that the baby was returned to the correct mother. Now, King Solomon was a wise man. Yes, he was known to be wise. God had given him the gift of wisdom. But in this instance, he was given a specific insight. He was given a way through clarity in order to break a deadlock. He received a word of wisdom. Folks, all of us should be growing in wisdom if we're going on with Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit, some of that is, is, is having the mind of Christ and growing in wisdom in a general sense. But what we're talking about here is those specific times when we need clarity, when we need a word of wisdom to unlock a situation. Vestry is a great one for that. Those who are in vestry will know there are sometimes we're all talking all around and think, ah, and I'll be sitting there desperately praying, Lord, give us a word of wisdom. Give us some clarity here. And then somebody, Barbara, or somebody will just say, boom. And we'll all know that's right. That's what we should do. That's what I'm talking about here. Whenever God gives clarity and insight to break through. With me? Then finally, we have the gift of discernment, spiritual gift of discernment, which is known also as a distinguishing between spirits. So God, the Holy Spirit, gives Christians, those who are following Jesus, the ability to recognize and distinguish between the influence of God or Satan, the world and the flesh, as Paul delineates the different ways in which we can be influenced. So whether it's God who's speaking, whether it's Satan, the world, or just our flesh. The best way to think about this is the following. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and what they're saying sounds fine, even sounds right, and yet in your spirit, in your guts, you've got a real uneasiness about what they're saying? Anybody had that experience? So the words all sound, well, that's okay. But in your spirit, you're going, that's not okay. There's something not right here. There's something amiss. Well, sometimes, oftentimes, if we're listening to God, God the Holy Spirit can be warning us through this gift of discernment. In Philippians 1, Paul prayed that the love of believers would abound, that the love of believers would abound, but that they would be able to discern what is best so that they would be pure and blameless on the day of Christ. And John urged the first century Christians to practice the gift of discernment because otherwise they could so easily be waylaid. Friends, I can't underline enough this particular gift, how important it is for us as Christians in this day and age. We need to be following the biblical instruction to discern, to test the spirits of what is being said to us to test ideas and philosophies and doctrines, to test what's coming out of the mouths of our politicians, through the mouths of community leaders, religious leaders, opinion formers, celebrities, to test what they're saying. Ask God to help you to discern and to filter what's coming so that you can cling to what is good and right and so you can question what isn't. Not so that we're cynical and negative, but so that we've got a spiritual edge and we're not just accepting everything that's coming our way. Let's discern, discern. So God the Holy Spirit can speak to us through a word of knowledge, through a word of wisdom, and by helping us to discern spirits. And a reminder that they're given to us to bless those around us and to glorify Jesus. But sadly, it is true to say that these gifts can be abused. They can be abused when we use these gifts to judge others or we can use these gifts to manipulate others so we get them to do what we want. You know, we say, well, the Lord has said that you should do X, Y, and Z. That's a manipulation. It's not right. Or oftentimes we can hear what the Holy Spirit says to us but misapply it because we don't ask that second question, Lord, speak. Lord, what do you want me to do with this? That's such an important question. Lord, speak. Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Sometimes we blurb stuff out when God gives us a word of knowledge so that we can pray and love somebody correctly. Not that we blurb it out and embarrass them. Sometimes it's right to speak it out, but we ask the Lord. Sometimes it's just good to use it to pray for them. There's lots I could say about this, but if you want to learn more about the practicalities, 
I can recommend at least a couple of books. The bottom line though here is that misuse isn't an excuse for non-use, but should be a spur to right use. These are good gifts and used correctly. They bring real freedom in life. So don't just dismiss them all because you're worried about misuse. Instead, seek to use them correctly. How can we do that But as I finish? How can we use them rightly? Well, step out sometimes in the exercise of these gifts with humility and love. And we do that by testing what we hear against what we know of God revealed in the Bible. So if what you hear lines up with what you know about God, then it's a good indication that it's of God. If it's not what's revealed in the Bible, then it's not right. Secondly, ask yourself, does it lift people up? Does it build people up? Because remember that these gifts are for glorifying Jesus and for edifying, building up others. So is what you heard going to build them up and encourage them and bring life to them? And is it going to lift Jesus if it's not? Put it aside, it's not of God. And then finally, because these gifts are processed and communicated by us, and we're all very fallible, we hear in part, then if you're sharing something, don't use authoritative language. Don't say, thus says the Lord. Instead, say something like, look, I think the Lord may be saying something like this. Graciously encourage others then to test what you've said to them, as we're instructed to do in Scripture. So with humility, with prayer, and with practice, by stepping out, let's grow in these spiritual gifts. Don't let fear of enduring the growing process stop you from starting. Instead, as Paul says, let's eagerly desire these gifts and practice them as he gifts us. Amen. Now we're going to listen to a song now, and I want you to put into practice what I've just been saying. Remember what I said at the beginning, just to check our hearts, and if we're dismissing this, ask yourself why, as it's clearly in the Bible, why are we dismissing good gifts from God? Yes, we've got to use them correctly, but don't dismiss it, and also don't disqualify yourself. Paul says explicitly that this is a gift for all people, all Christians, all people who are in Jesus. So we're going to play a song, and I want you, as the music plays, to be listening to God, to see if God wants to give you an encouragement for someone else, maybe in this room, maybe not. And then ask him if you do feel like maybe a verse or an encouraging sentence or something like that. Maybe you would want to write a wee card or phone them this afternoon if it lines up with the Bible, if it's going to encourage them. Step out and uh, have a go following the guidelines that I've given. Yeah, so let's listen to God as we listen to this song and uh, expect God, listen to God as he speaks. Thanks, Sonia.
And so folks, if there's something that you feel God has given you, then why don't you allow God to use you to encourage someone else by sharing that with them humbly and saying, look, this is what I, I felt God might be saying to you, if it's going to glorify Jesus and encourage them. And let's be doing this as part of our Christian work. A few notices then before we finish. Um, our Zoom Bible study continues, looking at Galatians this Tuesday. We had a Few new, a couple new faces on, on Tuesday, which was great. So it's open to anybody to plug in at any time. And if you want the Zoom meeting details, talk to myself or to Sonia. And next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating the goodness of God with a harvest-focused service here. But clearly, though, things are going to be very different this year uh, than usual. We're unable to decorate our church as usual. But... To those who generously donate flowers and fruit each year, thank you. Um, instead, in lieu of that, can I invite us all to make a gift to Storehouse? So we've got a connection with Storehouse, who are a local charity who give essential groceries and clothing, etc., to locally referred people who are in need. So it's a partnership that we want to continue. And what better way to celebrate the goodness of God than to share that goodness with others in our community who need it. So next Sunday, in lieu of flowers and vegetables and all the rest of that stuff, we're not doing that. But why not bring a gift for Storehouse? Put it in an envelope, market Storehouse, and we'll make sure that Storehouse gets it. Or alternatively, you can go on their website and give a gift to Storehouse online. And if you want to give something physical, then storehouse of two or three drop-off points around Belfast that are safe, COVID-free, COVID-friendly. Um, so you can go and do a drop-off if you want to. But otherwise, let's do some sort of financial support of storehouse. All right? Now, we've got a rescheduled Easter General Vestry and AGM um, on Tuesday, October the 13th at 8 p.m. in the church. Um, that's an important meeting in the life of the church we had to postpone it from easter we have to have it constitutionally in the next couple of weeks so we're having it on tuesday october the 13th there's going to be very brief reporting um, there's going to be the uh, there's a proposal for the re-election of the current vestry members until easter 2021 and then we need to elect diocesan representatives and parochial nominators because it's a triennial every three years we have to do those additional things so listen, the short answer, the short point is, if you're part of the church family here, we need you to come out and to be involved in, in that. We'll be doing it in this context. It'll be uh, socially distanced. We'll be wearing masks. We'll be doing things safely. 
but we need you to come out and to uh, do that business with us. You know that uh, every term or so we do a prayer breakfast with the other churches in our vicinity. Well, we're going to be doing that by Zoom on October the 17th. We're missing a meeting with them, but at the moment it's not safe to bring us all together. But we're going to have a, a Zoom prayer breakfast on October the 17th at 9.30. If you'd like to be involved in that, again, talk to Sonia or myself and we'll give you the details. And then last but not least, you should also on your chair have a little yellow sheet called Care Clusters. Have we look at that with me, would you? So it's a little sheet like this. Yellow, we've got colour codes today. Um, essentially what this is, is that over the last six months, it's been very hard to care for each other. And I think it's been a real struggle for some of us with the restrictions and with other things that had gone on. And we've been wrapping our heads around how can we in our church family support each other better. And so this is uh, what we've come up with. And a care cluster is either three individuals, three couples or three different families or a mixture of that who care for each other, who look out for each other in particular, who every two weeks they, one of them will phone the others and just say, look, how are you? What's going on? How can we pray for you? Share that amongst the group of three, or three couples, or three families, so that we're looking out for each other and supporting each other with a wee bit more uh, direction, with a wee bit more intentionality. All right? So what I'd love you to do is to think, maybe you've already got three people that you're close to that you already sort of do this with. Fine, that's great. Let us know that you've already sort of got a care cluster in place. But if you haven't, think about those you're close to and formalize an arrangement whereby you give each other a wee buzz every two weeks or you Zoom call or if restrictions allow, you go for a wee walk in the park or have a coffee outside, whatever restrictions allow, but that you connect regularly every two weeks and check in and that you pray for each other because that's key. So have a read through this. If you think to yourself, well, look, I'm friendly with everyone, then let us know and we can assign you a care cluster if that would be easier for you. We'll put you in a local care cluster of, of three, if that would help you. But what I'm saying is, I think if restrictions happen again and we go into another period of isolation, which let's face it, could happen, then we need to put things in place where we're supporting each other and standing with each other. And at the moment, we haven't got those things. So don't just push this aside and say, oh, you know, please do something about it. Read it through and do something about it and commit to a care cluster. It's just looking out for each other but with a wee bit more intentionality. All right, great, have we read? Let's stand as we finish. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. As our time of worship concludes, our time of service begins, and we return to our living and working amidst a world of need. We go from this place as recipients of God's gifts to share those gifts with the world around us. And as we go, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this day and always. Amen. <laughs> if we could just wait on this side until this side clears and then because we're a bit short on wardens so if this side could just stay in place and we'll clear this side and then we'll come over to this side just because we're a bit warden free this this week mm -hmm.